Excellent. We will get started. Thank you so much for your interest, and thank you for being here. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I am an International Affairs Fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a Public Policy Fellow here at the Wilson Center. Um, a quick programming note for those of you who might be interested. In this room at 4.30, the CEO of Pemex, the Mexican state oil company, will be here, and everyone is invited to participate in that as well. So you can just leave if you want, grab coffee in the corridor, and come right back after we conclude. We'll end just about 4.10. Um, I want to extend a special welcome to the Argentine Charge, Sergio Perez, who's here, Ambassador Valdez from the Chilean Embassy, and others who are joining us. This is an activity of the Latin American program here at the Wilson Center and its new initiative on Argentina, the Argentina Project, which recognizes the consequential political and economic reforms taking place in Argentina and seeks to provide to decision makers in both countries and to investors from both countries the critical and fair analysis um, to cement these processes and make sure they are successful. To learn more about that program, you can look on our website, on Twitter, or you can find me in the hallway pestering you to sign up to our newsletter, The Weekly Asado, um, which came out <laughs> this morning. So. The Argentine G20 presidency hasn't formally begun, and it doesn't begin until December, um, but its top negotiator, known as its Sherpa, has been hard at work for weeks and months now in preparing and in dealing with the Germans as they hand off these responsibilities. The G20 is arguably the world's premier forum for international economic cooperation, representing three quarters of global trade and two thirds of the world's population. The country that holds a rotating presidency has enormous influence over determining the G20 agenda, building support for and brokering agreements on concrete outcomes across a wide ranging agenda among member governments at the annual leader summit, which will take place next year or late next year in Buenos Aires. Though the G20 is at its best when grappling with global financial crises, uh, it, uh, such as when it played a vital role following the 2009, 2008, 2009 economic crisis and strengthening global financial architecture, it is increasingly ambitious and it has an increasingly diverse set of interests, including terrorism, migration, climate change, sustainable development, gender equality. As the G20 broadens its objectives beyond its traditional areas of trade openness, of fiscal and monetary policy, generating consensus becomes increasingly more complicated. This is to some degree inevitable given the diversity of membership in the G20, which includes both developed and developing countries representing a wide range of interests, including of course China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia, alongside the EU, the Canadians, the Americans, the United Kingdom, and of course Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. But what was clear at the Hamburg summit in July is that there's a new factor that's further complicating efforts to forge consensus around these consequential global agenda items, and that's the United States government. And this is especially true when it comes to very important issues for the G20 and globally, particularly trade and issues related to climate change. This was notable in Hamburg when for the first time ever, the G20, in addition to its standard communique, issued a separate 19-member declaration relating to climate change that excluded the United States. In this challenging context, the man in charge of keeping the G20 on track to meet its ambitious and lengthy past obligations and also to support negotiations for concrete commitments to address the globe's most pressing issues is sitting right here beside me. And I'd like you all to please welcome Ambassador Viagra. Ambassador Pedro Viagra is a, a lawyer and career diplomat who served in the Argentine Foreign Service since 1978. He was Argentina's ambassador to Australia from 2005 to 2016, and that included 2014 when the Australians mm -hmm. played host to the Leader Summit and during their G20 presidency. He's represented Argentina at the United Nations and in London, and until this past June, he was the Deputy Foreign Minister of Argentina. I'm going to begin by asking the ambassador a few questions, but then we will quickly turn to you for your insights and your questions as well. So once again, thank you for being here. I want to just talk for a second about this from an Argentina perspective and not a, the global view that I think you've been asked about a lot lately, which is to say the importance of this as part of President Macri's agenda of Argentina reemerging as a regional and global leader and reemerging as a relevant actor in, in international affairs. Well, I think that's uh, the reason why President Macri decided that to, to raise his hand for to have the presidency of the G20 in 2018, 
was precisely as part of this policy of coming back to normalcy, let's say, because the reality is that Argentina has played, we are not one of the main actors in the world, but Argentina has played a very important systemic role in the, in the international community for a long time, not just in question of economics, uh, non-proliferation, disarmament, human rights, international law. Uh, next year we are going to be commemorating the 40th anniversary of the start of the cooperation between developing countries, the CTPD as it was called in 78, so, and that was an initiative for an Argentine initiative at the time. So there was this uh, decision of President Macri to go into what is called the uh, intelligent reinsertion in the world, insertion in the world in fact, and Argentina has been in the G20 since its uh, creation, since 99, so it's not the first time we're there, but to be make it one step further, to be in the at the forefront and have the coordination of it uh, as, as the presidents. By the way, we can influence the agenda, but we are not the owners of the agenda, as you suggested. Uh, it is, in this particular case, it takes about 23 or 24 to tango instead of two to tango. <laughs> so <laughs> it's clearly something that we need, we have to do more, and it has to be a consensual kind of thing, uh, whatever happens. That, uh, uh, and that implies also not just the, the, the will to take this up and to show Argentina in what we can do, and I'm sure that we can do a good job provided we, we work together I among us in Argentina with the other members, of, of course, but also it's a great responsibility. Not like the, the other day one journalist said that I said that it was the most important uh, foreign challenge for President Macri. I think there are many other foreign challenges that are as important or more important, and certainly I would never say that what I'm doing is the most important thing. It doesn't look good to say that, <laughs> by the way. So, but I think it is a way to show that uh, we will take this commitment, that we are, it's not gonna be an easy task from the logistical point of view, from the substantive point of view. There's gonna be a lot of work, and of course, being the president of the G20, you can advance your agenda, that's the first thing you do, but then, the other mandate you have and the other interest you have, uh, national interest, is that the G20 will function well under your presidency. And that implies necessarily to bring, try to bring to bear, to bridge some of the problems that you have described. Because when you mentioned the question that we have been expanding into other things, going out from the core matters of the G20, and then the problems came up, no, well, the trade and investment is one of the main mm. core of the G20, and it's one of the problems where there is some division on what to do. But uh, uh, it's going to be um, quite an effort, and uh, we shall see how it goes. And we will depend on, on all the other members of the G20 and uh, also in the international community. There are the engagement groups that we have, and uh, B20, Business 20, Women's 20, Think Tank 20, Civil Society 20, and the like, and Labor 20. So it's a, it's a big operation. You mentioned when President Macri raised his hand and expressed interest in the G20, and to some degree it was a very different world, even though it wasn't that long ago. Watching the, the Hamburg summit, watching the phenomenon of the protesters there, but also the dynamics with the United States, Brexit, and, and some other factors that have made it more difficult to reach consensus. Was there ever a moment of regret? Was there ever a what did we get ourselves into kind no, of conversation? No, no, as far as I know, because, I mean, the world comes with changes, you know. It's uh, not, not, not something that you can... I expect, uh, and uh, uh, precisely the only thing that is uh, uh, to, to be expected in international affairs is change and, and the unexpected. And what happened in, in these uh, uh, last couple of a year and a half is that, uh, well, there was a change in the administration in the United States, but with a twist because it's, uh, it's uh, the President Trump was elected, he comes from outside of the political system, but that's what there is, and we have to deal with that. I, I don't agree that because there is this change of, uh, a, of administration in the United States, we have to just say, well, well we are going to do nothing. That, that would be the wrong approach, definitively. The thing that uh, we have to think about as well is because why are we expanding into these other subjects that are, let's say, non-core? And uh, one of the things that I, I keep um, uh, saying everywhere is that we have to be devoting ourselves also to the core matters, finance and microeconomics of the G20. But these things are started to coming up into the agenda, particularly from 2008, 2009, all these questions that have to do with the SDGs, okay. uh, that now they are specifically there, but they will start coming up. The, the need to 
to address issues of, um, of equality, social security, climate change, and all that, is because those issues do have impacts in, in the political and social sphere. And those impacts in social and political spheres do impact in the politics and therefore in the macroeconomic and other finances. So to believe these changes that you mentioned, which are certainly having an impact in globally, they are the result of people being the angst that some people have, what's going to happen with them, uh, particularly in, in the middle classes all over the world, not just in the United States or in Europe or elsewhere. And that has political consequences. And we have to remember that the economy has to be dealt by the politics, because it's a, and that's a reality. One of the, the, the first thing you have to do in order to implement a good economic uh, plan is to be in government. That's a little detail that some people <laughs> don't forget. I'm glad you, you brought up some of these other factors. The, I mean, setting aside the role of the United States and the interests of Europeans, the you know, G20 obviously represents sort of global interests and has global concerns, mm -hmm. particularly with poverty eradication, right. and has um, emerging market members as well. So I want to sort of think of the Argentine pressure that you may be under or to represent Latin Americans, for example, in this, or to represent emerging markets. There's only three Latin American members. There's only been one other previous summit. It was in Mexico in 2012. Mm -hmm. What's the sense of obligation or duty you feel, if any, that this is a Latin American G20 summit or that this is an emerging market G20 summit? Well, we have said, uh, President Macri has said, and, uh, and we as well, that uh, the Argentina will bring uh, a perspective not only of one country, that, but a perspective of the region, but without um, putting ourselves that we represent the uh, Latin America, we, we haven't been given a mandate to represent anybody, and that's a very important thing to do. But certainly, the only, the only way we can see the G20 or anything else is from a Latin American perspective, because it happens that we are Latin Americans. I mean, we were not born in Sweden, so there are uh, much I like the Swedes. I mean, I cannot have, an Argentina cannot have a Swedish perspective. So it will be a, a Latin American perspective from that point of view. Having said that, and this is a very important thing to keep in mind, you cannot drive a, a national agenda. I, I mentioned before that, of course, you have to advance your interests, but the G20 is a global thing. And by the way, and um, we have here Jonathan Fred, who he was uh, working on these things for a long time. The, uh, it's not only that the, the G20 is not the G7, it's that it was created because the G7 was thought to be insufficient to give solutions in 99 in the Asian crisis and again in 2008. So of course we can complement and it would be good that during our um, Presidency Canada will be the the chair of the of the G7, so there will be a synergy of this hemisphere in a way. But uh, we will have the perspective of the of the emerging economies, if you like, because that's the whole point of having the G20, not a G7. I mean, but we have to take into account the the perspectives of the of the uh, well developed uh, society as well, because that's the beauty of the G20 that it brings the 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 most uh, a, the heavier systemic players in, in the world, and, and then you go and you have this uh, preeminent forum for macroeconomic and, uh, and, and financial cooperation is not the most important forum in the world. For us, the most important is the UN, and so, but it is a clearly an important one. And then the other thing you have to do from this perspective of being in the, in the presidency of the, of the, of the G20 is to try to outreach and to get the, the feeling of others who are not sitting at the table, because the, by definition, the G20 tend to give a sort of a guidelines which have a, a, a sort of a global impact, where they are at least aspire to have a global impact. And for that, you are affecting, in a way, countries that are not sitting there. So the least you can do is to listen to them. And, and I think the, the outreach that we will try to do during our presidency will be going out not just to tell other countries in Latin America, Africa, Asia, or whatever they are, what we intend to do, but also to listen to what they think is relevant in this global, because at the end of the day, the G20, uh, what aspires is a stability and global governance, if specifically in finance and, and macroeconomics, but we are going into other things as well because people are interested in those things and the leaders are very interested in that. It's not a coincidence that when the leaders came to manage the G20, 
those items that are not of the, the ones that the guys uh, work in, a, work in a, by a few blocks from here in the IMF and the World Bank and all that would like to have only, is just simply because those are the things that really uh, interest the, 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 the leaders. And I think that we probably will, it would be a good idea if we could streamline the work of the G20, make things more concise, more, more uh, directive kind of uh, wording and uh, less jargons, less acronyms, please, because <laughs> I'm, in my case, coming from outside the financial and the macroeconomic, well, frankly, it's, uh, you get lost in the first page of the papers you read. I mean, that it has to be something that people, normal people, will understand. It is the message of the leader saying you what to do, what you intend to do. And then, of course, you can have more detailed documents. You may have uh, the annexes and all that, but, but you have to be clear what you, your intent is. And when we are concerned that uh, say, well, but we are bringing here like 20 or 30 new items to, to the plate, well, the, I'm sure that the desk of any leader gets about 500 of those every day. So let's not uh, over worry ourselves. Let me bring us back to Argentina for a minute. The, obviously, as you've pointed out, this is a global agenda and it's you know, designed for that. But you know, the presidency of the G20 gives an opportunity for promoting domestic reforms as well in a way sure. where it can, um, particularly if a country wants to assert leadership on an issue and promote good policy reforms elsewhere, it's helpful to be able to demonstrate that domestically you mm -hmm. are pursuing it, making these sacrifices and promoting that legislation. I'm wondering if, if President Macri and you sort of see this as an opportunity to do that. I don't know if it's anti-corruption or there's other areas where you think by putting it on the G20 agenda, you might have some extra leverage in the Argentine Congress. Well. Uh, um, Anti-corruption is going to be featuring very importantly in the in the agenda because it, it comes from previous presidencies. It is a, it is a critical thing, and certainly, it is all over the world. Probably the the, the circumstances we're living in through in in Latin America these days with all these uh, scandals on the payment bribes and all that may create a good opportunity to do that. But on the on the reform side, of course, each country will have to do the reforms that they deem that they can uh, actually implement. But that is precisely one of the objects of the, when the G20 was created at the end of the day, it's because something had to be done with the financial system as it was. And, uh, and in, in that had an impact in, in the whole of the economic uh, uh, structure of the, of the world. And in 2008, in fact, when there was a global financial crisis, it did work in a way. I mean, we will never know if it was just because the, there was the, some of the of the emerging economies that were actually pulling the, the whole system out of the doldrums in which it was, it was falling. But the reality is that there was a good cooperation at the time, a good cooperation that had not been happening before. And so that's, uh, that worked. It as, can the, be as the Sherpa, I think you have to take some credit for the G20 for helping solve the global financial well, yes, crisis. Well, yes, yeah, but, but, but again, when you, you say that, well, with what is uh, President Macri and myself thinking about reforms, believe me, that's, those are things that President Macri will decide, not me. I mean, I, I have the impression that, uh, but uh, he, as a, a sharp of the G20, of course, the G20 can uh, uh, provide not, not uh, they will not make recommendations to be used internally in Argentina or in the United States or, or anywhere, but this, if you make recommendations how the system should work and what it can deliver and how it should deliver, of course, you need to do the adjustments in each of the jurisdictions to make sure that these things could happen. And it's not just a letter that is uh, uh, standing there and uh, nothing is uh, really implemented. So speaking of President Macri, this will be my, my last question for now. I know he's not announced his priorities yet, and obviously you're mm -hmm. gonna wait until he does. Um, but I wonder if there's sort of broad categories of interest that you think might guide the portion of the mm -hmm. agenda and the communique that Argentina will be introducing that's new. The Germans, obviously, they were interested in issues of international tax enforcement. They were interested in migration and in, in issues with global mm -hmm. public health. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of interest in Africa tied to migration to some degree. Mm -hmm. are, are there areas such as that that we might see emerge? Well, we will, we will continue the agenda that has come up. And, uh, and by the way, the, the guys working in the so-called financial track are doing the job, it seems, much uh, faster than we in the Sherpa track. Maybe it is because uh, we politics, uh, the guys that come from the politics side tend to argue a bit more because they, yesterday I was told that they finished by, by noon what they were supposed to be finishing today by noon. And so either they are efficient or they have nothing to do. We will check <laughs> out on that. But uh, the, 
that, that is the agenda where we are going to have, of course, the, the one that comes up. Uh, the, some of the, of the items, and you're right, President Macri will announce the priorities formally in, in, on the 1st of December or the 30th of November when we are handed over the prisons by the, by the Germans. But there are some things that we can know. With gender, you mentioned it, it's uh, for us it's an important thing. The, perspective, the gender perspective has to be not as a sort of a niche there, uh, which it is in empowerment women in the agenda of the, G uh, of the, um, of the G20, but everywhere. It has to be a transversal thing. It has to be a, even in the, in the financial aspects and, uh, and even in the engagement groups, because you'll be surprised, for instance, when you go to some of the engagement groups in the B20, how, how few uh, women and uh, business women are there uh, that uh, get active. And so this is something we have to change, and it's not a question of... Uh, of uh, being in Latin America or whatever. That, that's something that has to change, of course. Then another question that is very important for everyone, I think, it is the future of employment, the future of work, and the effect on that uh, to combine with education and digitalization, because this is one of the, probably one of the areas that is creating more uncertainty in, in people, and uh, particularly in the middle classes all over the world. And those. The, the other good thing about that, the, which is also a bad thing, of course, is that this, it, this happens everywhere. It's not just a, a worry for developing countries. It's something that is very crucial also in developed countries. And, uh, there is the, and that has an impact in, the, well, the SDGs as well. Uh, the inf financing for infrastructure is a critical issue that we need to, because uh, if we are going to have an inclusive uh, global society, people need to be able to, to not just to produce things, but to be able to use this process to send it to market, have access to health, uh, have access to education, have access to, to, um, to electricity, or even, even the digital divide, in which is uh, pretty big. And one thing that we have to be conscious, all of us as well, is that uh, the gap, the inequality gap is growing very fast. W all over the world. It's not just a question of the developing countries either. <laughs> it's, uh, and those are things that somehow will have to be addressed because if they are not, they will provoke reactions in the people that are disadvantaged. Um, so those being, I'm sure that we will do something on agriculture as well. I mean, being Argentina, we could not uh, just forget about those things. But those are just broad uh, categories in which uh, then they will be f um, taken with more finesse when the president announces the, the actual priorities, which I want to insist on this is important. Having the priorities doesn't mean that the rest of the agenda is not a priority, obviously. And just briefly to finalize, I mean, you did mention climate at the Argentine embassy mm -hmm. when you discussed this. That's obviously a sensitive one, but very President Macri has been very ambitious in his treatment of his Paris Agreement um, obligations, and he, mm -hmm. in fact, increased Argentina's commitments and has been a leader in that area. Do you have any sense of how Argentina might engage or advance on this? Well, that would be complicated because we know where the problems lie there. And uh, by the way, you mentioned the question, there was a separate declaration. There was no separate declaration. There was uh, on climate change. In the Hamburg Declaration, there was one paragraph on climate change. I had one paragraph that, I mean, one chapter on this. You had one paragraph that applied to everybody was in agreement. Another one which reflected the position of the United States, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the Paris Agreement and the use of fossil fuels, and then another paragraph of the other 19, but there was not a separate declaration altogether. The only one that was a separate declaration was the one coming out of the retreat on terrorism in which everybody agreed, and the same one on Marine Litter. Climate change is a, is a controversial issue. Not a controversial issue in the sense most countries in the G20 and elsewhere agree that the climate change is for real, it, we have to do something. Uh, many countries are uh, committed to the Paris Agreement. Argentina is one of them. We are parties to the treaty. We, uh, we intend to, to, to fulfill our obligations and to, to achieve the goals, the, the, or the mission goals that, they, that are there. But the G20 is an, an operation that w works by consensus, and there is one country, happens to be a big one, that have uh, some doubts about that, to say the least, and uh, we have to try to work out some language that can we can all live together. I'm sure that eventually the, these things would be um, not solved, because, uh, but certainly something can be achieved. It's not the only 
the only controversial issue. I mean, trade and particularly more than trade, the, the role of the WTO, which is also crucial again for us and for, for many countries, uh, uh, has been being put into question in a way that at least we managed to get some uh, sort of a, um, a consensus there, even, that the, even if the paragraphs are not exactly the ones that everybody would like to have. One thing that I would recommend to the analyst of, um, of the documents is that when you see, when you read the Declaration of Hamburg, you, you think that, well, this, uh, it's very poor, the document is, uh, it's not because there are, th it's not only what is there, the things that are not there are not, they're, they're, they're not just missing because we were just sleeping at the wheel and we don't realize, we didn't realize that there were so, so such important things that we forgot to include, it was because uh, the negotiations, there were some guys that didn't want them included, would not accept them, and so that's why they are missing there. Don't think it is just an, an oversight from the Sherpas, which you, we can have this oversight <laughs> because if, when you finish at 3 a.m., 4 a.m. discussing these things, you may have a few, uh, a few things missing, your, your sense of, your senses among them as well. <laughs> Thanks. A anyone, please join us in, uh, if you've got questions, I think we've got, one or two microphones available, so please let us know. Yes, in the back. No. Okay, first of all, thanks for the, the talk, very clarifying. I have a, a question, maybe we touch it at the end, about climate change and the position. I know Germany had a position in energy and climate were in the same working group, and I would like to know Argentina's position, having in mind, well, the US, et cetera. So how are you thinking, or how is Argentina thinking in tackling this issue, and will climate have its own group? Will it be with energy, will it not be? Etc. Thank you. In principle, we're looking at having a, 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 an energy sustainably a, a sustainable energy group and another one on climate sustainability group, two two separate groups. But this is something we have to talk with the with the other members again. But that's the idea would be to have the two on separate tracks. Please, Cindy. Thanks so much. Uh, Cindy Arnson, director of the Latin American program here. Um, two questions. You mentioned that, um, that it was important to include other issues in the agenda beyond strict sort of financial stability of the international system. How do you decide what's in and what's not? Because once you start opening it up to questions of inequality and climate change and whatever, I mean, does it become just a catch-all that becomes very unwieldy and, and therefore very difficult to come to consensus on, on, on on anything else. Another question unrelated, which is that in many ways the optics around the meeting in, in Hamburg was dominated by the violent protests against uh, the meeting of the G20. Um, Argenti Argentina is obviously a country with a long history of, of social movements and social protest. Um, how is the Macri government looking ahead to be able to handle and manage that dynamic? Mm -hmm. Well, the first question is obviously it's not that um, the, these new um, items that have started coming up in the agenda have happened over a period of, of years, obviously, because you know, when, you get a, when you get a new, uh, new subject coming into agenda, it's not easy to take you out, and there are you start with the working group, you start uh, with uh, documents and also with plans of action and things that are obviously, they start enlarging the agenda, that is true. That's why I mentioned just in passing that we'll try to do the streamlining, but it's not gonna be easy to just take items out because when you start making the list, it's not easy to say, well, we are not going to talk about health. We are not going to talk about the uh, SDGs. We are not going to talk about uh, anti-corruption. We are not going to talk about energy. So when you have to make you pick and which are the things that you don't want to talk about, you realize that it's not uh, easy to, to choose them. And I would just uh, 
But what you can do is to try to focus on what has to be done. Um, from my perspective, we should not try, the G20 is not there just to try to replicate negotiations and discussions that are taking place in other fora, which are specifically created for that. Of course, you can take some of the broad lines of those things and give the guidelines in providing that the, 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 the members can come to an agreement. And, and surprisingly, in fact, the first time that there was not an agreement or a consensus in a, in a declaration was in the, on climate change in Hamburg. I mean, this before, there had been consensus. So you can say that, well, there, there's not uh, um, enough action. Well, the G20, by definition, is not is a mechanism that doesn't have any structure. So it has to go to the to the bodies that actually can to have to do that, be the IMF or be the UN or be the the COP in the case of uh, of climate change. And now it's not a place to what everybody will go. And we know that there are some that would not like to be there. But uh, but I, I I think it's uh, we have to keep in mind that the this expansion of the agenda as I mentioned before, reflects the, the actual concerns of people. And uh, it's not just uh, that you're going to do it in, in the financial and uh, uh, when we had the, the global financial crisis 2008, there were lots of people that were way beyond the financial problem. I mean, they lost their houses, they lost their jobs, they lost their lives. So, uh, so obviously you have to respond to that, particularly when you, when you are the leader. I'm, I'm not suggesting by any uh, by any means that the, the ministers of finance do not care about that, but, uh, but certainly the leaders do care more than the financial uh, sector in this. And so that's one thing that we have to keep in mind. We'll try to see, as I mentioned before, to try to make it um, a shorter communique. Then, then you have some annexes that will indicate precisely what to do. And there are some of the mandates of the G20 also that extend not only over a period of years, but also that you are supposed to produce the results in, for instance, the, in a number of years. We had the, the in, in Brisbane that you mentioned, uh, there was this uh, goal of uh, achieving 25% of uh, in, in income for women in, in, in jobs, and then the, we will have a, a growth will be 2% more than the, what was um, uh, forecast, and that was, the report on that will have uh, will come under the Argentine president. So these things are being carried on. Are we going to manage to do that? I don't know. We, I was the other day in a, in a presentation here in in Washington. The first day, the first thing I did was to go to this presentation, and uh, around the table there were like 20, 20 people, very very uh, sensible people, who all of them said that uh, we should avoid this kind of thing of uh, having the Christmas tree, everyone coming with new things, and each of the 20 proposed three or four new items. So, mm -hmm. so that's the way it works. <laughs> then the other, you, the, the other question was? Well, the, well, the protests, well, the, uh, you cannot avoid them. I mean, you have them everywhere, and so the, the only possibility of having a, a G20 or a WTO or whatever, or the APEC or whatever, without protests is not to have them, which I don't think is a good idea. And uh, in Hamburg, uh, of course, there were all these protests. We, I never managed to see one, unfortunately, because we were just, one of the things that happened in this case, you are cocooned. I mean, you're put into the, the, the compound with the, the things that are happening, and I was receiving all these WhatsApps and emails, are you all right, are you safe, or whatever. And I never saw one of those. I, I got very frustrated, really, because it, it <laughs> seems that everybody had all this news and then nothing. But of course, they were very big. But even then, I, I think you, you mentioned that Argentina has a history of uh, protests and all that. I hope that that's uh, given us a good training as well. And, uh, but I, I think that if you take the proper action, you can really do it well. I mean, it has to be done uh, with time, and it has to be done uh, in a way which is not aggressive, but at the same time makes everyone feel safe. I think it's, it's perfectly doable. It's not uh, going to be easy. By the way, in Hamburg, I, one of the things that I keep saying is the, the common wisdom is that everything had to do with the protests in Hamburg. That was the big thing because it was everywhere. Actually, the most important thing that happened to the G20 in Hamburg were precisely the changes that the United States introduced 
in the fundamentals of the of the many of the chapters that was much more important i have the impression that that would be much more lasting than the protest and so uh, you know sometimes the uh, the press will sell what is uh, with this uh, sellable, of course, and, and, and it was with a very good reason because these things were very serious. By the way, I, I walk every morning at about 6 a.m. and in Hamburg I had to do it earlier because otherwise you will not make it to these meetings. And when I went for my walk, there were uh, you could go everywhere. So it seems that the, the protesters in Germany work from nine to <laughs> onwards. That's not a very productive way to protest, I have to say. Good not to interrupt your exercise, yeah. though. Uh, another question over here, and please introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, up front and then, and then back there. Maybe we'll do both these questions, and then we'll answer them together. OK, thank you. Uh, my name is Sergio Martinez, and I'm coming from the Energy Program and the Inter-American Dialogue. And I want to talk about the energy sector in Argentina. Is I, want, I am interested to know more about the sustainable energy group that you mentioned. Just in this morning, it was released that Argentina and Chile will complete the signature of a gas agreement in like by the end of October. And I am concerning if uh, regarding uh, international commitments, uh, what what do we what can expect in the energy sector in Argentina? Is the energy matrix is going to change, or more regulations are going to be accomplished? Thank you. Well, those are, we'll, those we'll, are we'll do one more question, okay. and then we'll have some time. Uh, my name is Pia Marquejani. I come from an farm, an NGO in Argentina. Thank you very much for the, the useful points. And my comment or question has to do with the emphasis in financing for infrastructure. Uh, working and visiting the World Bank meetings, we've seen a very important consensus around the role of PPPs on the private sector. And I, I wonder how that could or, and, or not hinder advancements in SDGs, climate change agendas, and together with uh, 50 other civil society organizations from 150 different countries, we send a, a, a manifesto with our concerns, especially on the fiscal risk, transparency issues, and a couple of other points. And I was wondering, considering the Latin American presidency next year, the emerging economies, how is Argentina thinking of dealing with this? Do you have any comment on this? Thank you. Well, we want, in, in terms, I will start from the, well, first of all, with the question of energy, is not a bilateral thing, that we are, the G20 will have directives which apply to everyone, so it will be energy efficiency, be new forms of energy, but not the bilateral between, and fortunately, we are going to have the, the Chileans are going to be our, one of the invited guests, so we are going to be working together, but not in the bilateral, Juan Gabriel, no, in this <laughs> particular case, we're going to see the perspective of Chile and Argentina having a, a, in the global impact of, uh, of, the, of the things that have to be done in the energy market. The, and on the question of the, the, the infrastructure, well, we have to, uh, to make the MDBs and others, not just the MDBs, uh, but also we are looking to for, for, for um, finances of infrastructure. We're looking also to more public partner, uh, private partnerships as well. So we have to, the, the SDGs are not going to be implemented if you don't get financing. And in fact, for, for development and for infrastructure, both come together. It's not just a question of uh, building roads, building ports, building uh, uh, bridges. You have to do also uh, education. You have to do things that come in, in terms of health and, uh, and rural development as well. So, and, uh, and we have received uh, some of the of the manifestos with all these uh, preoccupations of the of civil society. By the way, you have a, we have a C20, which is civil so a civil society 20 as well, which I will encourage you to get in touch with them because they, they are the, in all the members of the of the G20 to try to convey this. Because the the whole point of having the, the engagement groups, as they are called, is to bring to the table of the G20 and to the leaders their concerns and see if they can fit in this. Uh, in these projections that we were going to have and in the policies that are supposed to be uh, coming out of the, of the summit. Please. Uh, Steve Chapman, professor over at GW and a current fellow here at the Wilson Center. Yes, microphone. Uh, Steve Kaplan, uh, current fellow here at the Wilson Center, also a professor over at GW. Uh, with the increasing emphasis uh, coming from the US on bilateralism rather than multilateralism, how does this change the role of the G20, if at all? Well, we've seen it in Hamburg. 
uh, does. Of course, it, it may change the role of the G20, and that's precisely one of the challenges of the presence of the G20, as it was the, in the, when Argentina takes over, as it was one of the main challenges of the uh, German presidency. But fundamentally, the challenge of all the members of the G20 is to try to keep the Americans engaged. That's the whole thing. I mean, you can either say, well, okay, they have changed it so that we don't want to talk with you. I mean, we are 19 and doing 19 no better than you do. Uh, that's an approach, uh, which I think it will be wrong. I think, uh, of course, it might well happen that it will not be possible to reach these consensuses because obviously some of the, of the difference may be deep enough as to touch on things that are of crucial importance for, for members of the G20 in one direction and some others may, the United States, is the, which is the subject of your question coming from the other side. But certainly I am personally convinced that we must try. I mean, that's, we have to try to see if we can bridge the gap as far as possible. And one of the possibilities that we will have to go uh, until uh, to the point where it is possible to reach consensus. And I, I insist in the question of in Hamburg, we couldn't reach consensus in in climate change, but we could in the rest. I mean, with the lower level of expectation, there was obviously, you can say, many people would feel disappointed because they were not the same things that were adopted in, in, in Hangzhou or, or, or previously. But well, that's what there is. And, uh, and uh, in this case, it is the United States, the, the one that have made the, the major changes. In some other case, maybe another country. And so we have to be prepared for that. I mean, that's, that's what... Um, that's uh, precisely the job of the of the presidency will be that to try to message those things and the constructive ambiguities to which we diplomats are so attached to may help here. Yes, in the middle there. Yep, right here. Hi, my name is Ana Hurtado. I'm an Argentinian student at George Washington University. You briefly mentioned the like domestic side of this and the importance of the global aspect. But I mean, we, there's a lot of discussion in Argentina and with like foreign investments and the development of the economy, all that. Do you think that this presidency will play a role, if any, in this foreign investment and developing the domestically the economy as well? Well, it could have, a, I think that not directly in the sense that we're not going to be using the, the G20 as a platform for investments to Argentina only, but certainly was. The first thing I said that this shows the commitment of the, of the Argentine government to engage with the world again on the rules, which are the, the, the global rules, and that of course have, uh, relates to investment as well. By the way, in the, in, the, uh, in the G20, there is a group of trade and investment. So investment is already there. And the, the World Bank is very interested in having some uh, specific things on investment coming up as well. That will impact on the, the, the what we are going to, uh, to, to adopt or try to adopt in the G20 will be, as I said from the beginning, global, not just referring to Argentina or to the United States or to China on their own, isolately. But certainly, we hope that this will show to investors, that will show to the, to the global community and to the economic community in particular that Argentina is really serious in the way we are open to business for business and we want to engage in, in terms of that which are um, uh, normalcy rules, if you like. I think we, we can take, how about two more questions and then we'll, we'll collect them now and that'll be, <coughs> then we'll conclude. One over here, yep. Hello, my name is Jimena Sanchez and I'm with the Washington Office on Latin America and just returned from a uh, sabbatical at CELS in Buenos Aires. Um, the Macri government really shows a significant shift, not just in terms of its economic openings towards the rest of the world and domestic economic policies, but in many other ways like security, migration, and, and uh, fiscal responsibility compared to the prior decades in Argentina. And so I'm wondering to what extent and what aspects of that may become a priority in your leadership in the G20. And then um, secondly, you mentioned that uh, you will be bringing a Latin American perspective, even though it doesn't represent all. And what 
what do you think is a perspective that's very needed for the rest of the world coming from the Southern Cone? Well, the coming from the from the back, I mean, the perspective of a developing country is that you need to. Argentina has uh, about a third of its population under the poverty line. So obviously, whatever we do, we won't have an impact, and G20 is included. It's not that the G20 is a tool for that as a only, but this this is the kind of perspective that we are mentioning. We need investment, we need opening, we need more transparency, we need to fight corruption, we need to do things which are sensible in terms of bringing these people that are below the poverty line into, into a standard of living which is decent, as Argentina used to have in the past. And that's, that's something that is uh, certainly will be guiding this. And the, on, the, on the domestic priorities, even though we are not going to be making it only in the domestic priorities, of course they have to, to represent the, the, some of the, of the priorities we are going to have, and that's why I mentioned some of those. That are in, in, in that more uh, attuned to what you you mentioned. I mean, this question of opening and making people really um, uh, progress, and for that you need to to address these things like the the future of employment that I mentioned, the investment in for infrastructure, education, the digitalization, digitalization, plus all the other things that are in the in in the G20, and. Let's come back to the uh, what I mentioned at the beginning. It is important to keep in mind that the the elements that have to do with the financial and macroeconomics of the of the origins of the G20 are still important because if we don't have a financial or macroeconomic stability and governance, probably we will not succeed in any of these things of bringing people into uh, raising the standard of living, bringing investment to Argentina or elsewhere. It's the same. Any final remarks? Well, it's going to be a tiring exercise, I, I can <laughs> tell you, because it's uh, we're about 15, uh, a month and a half from the moment that we're going to take the presence. I'm already exhausted, so <laughs> it's, it's, not, uh, it's not so. But it's, I hope it's going to be fun. And uh, the remark I want to do is that I thank very much Cynthia, for, the, for this and to you as well. Uh, for the Wilson Center, and, and uh, we hope that this is uh, an exercise that we can continue during the, the Argentine presidency as uh, things evolve and things are, are moving ahead. Um, I think that that would be um, a good thing just not only to, to keep you abreast of what we're doing, but also for getting the feedback of how you see things are going because, I mean, the Wilson Center is an important and the Latin American program is an important perspective for that. And you can do some advocacy here as well. I said, and I don't want to put any pressure on you, but uh, <laughs> on why the, the G20 is very good for every member, uh, <laughs> and particularly for some, for instance, for the founders of it. That's, uh, that could be a good uh, message to, to carry, and uh, you can help on that. I have to say that I'm uh, especially, I'm delighted Juan Gabriel de Chile will be with us in this one. We have a very good friendship with, uh, and, uh, well, personally, I knew him for quite a few years, but then the relationship between Chile and Argentina is very close, and certainly we, we hope that this will bring a good perspective of to the, to, from the region to, to, to the G20. And Jonathan, I hope to be working with you as well. So thank you very much, all of you, and um, I, I look forward to, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's with a certain caveat. I look forward <laughs> for the success of the G20. Excellent. Well, listen, thank you very much. I don't know if we can take the assignment you've given us on getting total consensus, but we will be a partner in this and certainly <laughs> okay. keep reflecting on the work you're doing, and you're always welcome to come back. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it.